met him a few times. I've heard him speak several times. 2012. I know I don't do math well, sorry. Uh, I don't do math well or speak very good either. So uh, 2012, thank you for speaking out. 2012, when we, when we moved to North Carolina is when I met Brother Christian and um, heard a lot about him. He was, he was the youth pastor at the time at Faith. Um, first time I heard him speak, kind of like the Brother Tommy, I was just like, wow, you know, wow. I was blown away because you can tell that, you know, God was with him and he was allowing the Lord to use his heart and use his life to touch people. I've heard him speak several times and I've never, um, I have never left a sermon that he's preached and not been touched. And I know that's not because Brother Christian is his great speaker, even though he is, but it's because Brother Christian gets out of the way and lets God use his life. And he just preaches the messages that God, that God has on his heart. And so I'm so, th so thankful for a man like that. I would say some more about him, but we talked about him up here for three minutes. You got to know him a little bit more. So, Brother Christian, will you come and speak to us tonight? Thank you, brother. Thank you. I love you. Brother. Would you take your Bible tonight, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if you would turn there. I know there's a lot going on this evening. The young people are going bowling at the, uh, after we have church. And uh, I, I'm a terrible bowler. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there to you. How many of y'all like me are just bad bowlers? Go ahead. It's okay. Tell the truth. Let the Lord love you. All right. I am a terrible bowler. In fact, when my wife and I were dating, we dated for a long time. We dated for four plus years. And we would, you know, we'd go bowling. And in fact, our very first, well, unofficial but official date when we started sparking, y'all know what I'm talking about. You adults know what I'm talking about, right? When you, you know, y'all know what, what I'm talking about, sparking. I mean, she started liking you, you started liking her, and all right. It was at a bowling alley on a church teen activity. It was all night bowling. Now, let me just say this. By the end of it, you know, it's 5, 6 in the morning. N ain't nobody feeling good at 5, 6 in the morning after you bowled all night. H has anybody ever tried to bowl all night long? Did, brother, whoever the first moron was to ever invent that. I, I don't know what you're talking about, but anyway. <laughs> I, anyway, when my wife and I, we started dating anyway but i i decided into our dating relationship i am not going to carry her bowling anymore would anybody like to know why <laughs> absolutely my wife beat me at bowling and young men let me give you some good some good courtship advice or dating advice or whatever whatever i know that's taboo let me give you some good counsel about chicks <laughs> don't date a chick that beats you at bowling. Let me just throw that out there to you. All right, just go ahead and draw that line in the sand. Or you can keep dating her, but don't go back bowling again. Right? Can I get an amen in the house for that? All right, some of you men are afraid to amen because you're about to get an elbow straight to the ribs. I know, I understand. But anyway, I am th thrilled and honored, I really am, to be able to share the word tonight. And so, I do want to be a help and not a hurt. I, I know that uh, I don't want us to be so time conscious that we lose sight of why we're really here. And we're really here to hear from God and to, to look at His Word. Because if I don't share with you the message from God's Word, God's book, I don't have a message to share. All I have is my opinion. And you can put 99 cents with my opinion and go to McDonald's and get a cup of coffee. That's about how much my opinion is worth. But this book is worth the entire world. And so I am called by God. I am called by God as a man of God. That's what I'm supposed to be, a man of God. I'm called by God to preach this word. I'm not to change it. I'm not to alter it. I'm not to try to explain it away. I'm just told to teach it and preach it and declare it. And that's what the Lord's told me to do. So I want you to pray for me as I try to do that this evening. I know this, 
I learned a long, long time ago that the only thing that will change somebody's life is the power of the Word of God. The Bible is the only book God ever wrote. It's the only book I'm commanded to preach. And it's the only book that we're all going to be judged by when we stand before God. And it's the only book I've been commanded to live by. It's the only book that will ultimately tell me how to get successfully through this life and to heaven. And buddy boy, you better know that that kind of book I want to perk up and listen to whenever it's being taught or preached. And so I'm excited. I'm, 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 you know what? I'm more excited about the baptisms tonight than I even am the bowling. Can I get a witness, church? Isn't that, listen, don't ever, don't ever get to the point where you're not excited anymore about what the Lord is doing, even when, when, especially when somebody gets saved and somebody joins the church and when somebody follows Christ in believers' baptism. Because there are scores of churches all around you. Their baptistry is nothing more now than a broom closet and a storage room. You better thank Jesus that God has put you in a church tonight where they understand what the Great Commission is all about. Winning people, baptizing them, and teaching them to follow Jesus like the Scripture outlines. And we all give glory to God for that. Amen. I had the privilege for 21 years to, to be a youth pastor. And I, I graduated from Southeastern College in 1993. And just a little bit after that, that summer in August, I, I moved to Goldsboro, North Carolina. And I've been there ever since. I, I kind of grew up in Raleigh. Uh, I tell people that I wasn't born in Goldsboro, but I got there as quick as I could. <laughs> and I feel like that because it's home to us now. I've been there 26 years, 26 and a half. I'm, I'm still waiting for my church to vote me out. But anyway, I'm hoping they don't so I can stay there longer. But it's, it's home to my wife and I now. She grew up in Raleigh. I grew up in Raleigh. I, I lived in Goldsboro almost a year before we got married. Well, when I got married, the Lord helped me to be able to put a little tiny down payment down on this little small Cracker Jack house. I mean, it was tiny. Had two bedrooms, one bath. But you know what? It's all we needed. And I was as thrilled over that little house. And, and, and you folks who are married, you understand what I'm talking about. We didn't have diddly. I mean, we didn't have squat. We didn't have two plug nickels to rub together. I was an assistant pastor, and I mean, not long out of college. And uh, anyway, I mean, we didn't have, it, but I, I, I did save up my money, put a down payment, was able to buy that little house. And I, I mean, it, got, it all kind of came together just right before I got married. And so I didn't really take time to notice the yard. When you're trying to get married, I was trying to save up money for an engagement ring. You don't ask me how little I spent because I'm embarrassed to tell you what I spent on my wife's engagement ring. And it, I mean, it was not much at all. Uh, but anyway, you, you remember that cup of coffee at McDonald's? But anyway, no, I, it was a little bit more than that. And so I was trying to save money for a ring, save money for a honeymoon. Uh, how many of y'all remember like your honeymoon when you had to like count the car, go through the cards before you left town to see if you had enough money to go on a honeymoon? You might know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, praise the Lord, we were able to spend you know some time away, and and then you come back. And so we came back, we moved into our little house, and 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 I noticed that there was. In our front yard, something that I didn't notice before we got married. I mean, I never even spent the first night in the house by myself until I got married. So I realized that, that, that I had a little tree, a little tree planted in my front yard. I mean, like smack dab right in the middle of the yard. Now, I like trees. I didn't notice the tree before. It was just a cute little tree that was growing in my front yard. I mean, square in the middle, right in the middle of my yard. Well, I like trees. Trees are pretty to me, especially in the fall of the year, the springtime. So I was going to do everything I could to make sure that this little tree 
made it. So I asked somebody, that, that uh, a fellow staff member at the church, you know, what do I do to make sure this tree survives? It's a little, tiny, small baby tree. What do I do? They said, well, you need to, I don't know why they told me this. I don't even know if this is right or wrong. They said, well, you can always put fertilizer down there at the base of it. They said, make sure you water it. So every day, like, like I, you know, you just got married. I didn't have a water hose, so I went to Walmart and bought a water hose, amen. <laughs> when every, I, I'd go out there in the evening because it's hot, you know, in Goldsboro, it's hot just like it is in Hamilton. And so I'd water my tree. And uh, I, look, look, somebody had given us, a three-legged lawnmower. You say, why is it three-legged? Because it only had three wheels. And that's why. So, but literally, they were going to throw it in the dumpster. And I'm like, hey, don't throw that puppy in the dumpster. I'll take it. And it ran. Anyway, it had three wheels, so I had to hold it up and turn my mouth just right as I pushed and mowed. But it worked, right? So I, 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 would, I would gently and delicately mow around that tree to make sure I didn't bump it or do anything harmful to it. So all that summer and fall, I'd go out and water the tree. So wintertime came. Of course, the leaves started falling off, and they started kind of going dry a little bit early, falling off a little early, and I thought, well, that's, that's kind of strange. But I didn't really think anything about it. I just kind of let it go. And so the springtime came around, and I noticed that at springtime, it didn't do anything. Like, I mean, there were no buds on the little tree. No little flowers or little dingleberries or whatever it was that was supposed to sprout on the tree. I don't know. So, I mean, it's nothing. No leaves or anything. And I remember it was around springtime. I was out there again mowing with my three-legged lawnmower. I think I had gotten actually a wheel put on it by this time. So it had four, four legs. And so I was out there mowing, and my wife was over here in the little flower garden. My wife has a green thumb. I have no thumb. And when it comes to that, so she's planting flowers and weeding and all that kind of stuff. So she was over here doing that. And I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. And I came up and with my lawnmower, I, 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 I committed a boo-boo. I, I hit my tree. And when I hit my tree, the tree poof, toppled over just like that. And buddy, I let out a gasp. Because I'm telling you, I love that little tree. I, I, I had bought fertilizer. I had watered that tree. I had done everything I knew to do. I think maybe even at Christmas time, I even went out there and put a little strand of lights around that little tree like every redneck should. But anyway, uh, you know, and so when that tree toppled over, I, I'm like, ooh. I don't know where that noise came from, but that's what. And my wife, I said, honey, look. She Looked up, and I, I, I'm horrified that my tree uh, apparently has come out of the ground, like completely out of the ground. So I let go of the lawnmower. I walked over to the tree, and, and I picked it up with one hand. That's how small it was. And I lifted it up thinking I was going to see a root system at the bottom. And I saw no root system. I saw, saw no soil, nothing. I picked it up and I looked, and it, it, it looked like that somebody had shaved off, like, the bottom of my little tree. And so I'm trying to put two and two together. Who would have done that? Somebody sabotaged my little tree and then stuck it in the ground to deceive me. Well, then it dawned on me, hey, Sherlock, you know, McFly, hey, it wasn't a tree to begin with. Nobody sabotaged your tree. It wasn't even a tree. It was a limb from a nearby tree that some joker went during my honeymoon and he found out it was one of my teenagers. It was your brother-in-law, Zachary Bell, is who it was. He was in my youth group, and he went, and I don't know why, they were going to toilet paper my yard. That's what it was. They were going to toilet paper my yard, and they got scared because of my neighbors, and so he thought, well, I ain't going to TP his yard. I'm going to do something else, though. So they were hiding in the woods. He yanks off a limb from a little dinky tree and goes and sticks it in my front yard. And for a solid nearly a year, 
idiotic me, gullible CP, had been watering that thing, fertilizing that thing, decorating that thing for Christmas. <laughs> Just hoping that one day it was going to thrive into this monstrosity of a tree in my front yard. And it wasn't even a tree. It's just a stick. That's all it was. So I want to ask you tonight, here's the title of my sermon. It's life-changing. It really can be if you'll listen. Are you a tree? Or are you just a stick? I want you to look at your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It's interesting if you take the time to read all of 2 Corinthians, but especially verses 1 through 4, what you'll find out is just to give you a little background that the Corinthians were demanding proof of Paul's apostleship. Hey, Paul, prove to us that you're really an apostle. And so he spends a lot of time in this book, in this letter, giving them proof of his apostleship. But it's almost like the Holy Spirit leads the apostle Paul to kind of switch gears Instead of him now defending himself in his own apostleship, instead of him producing proof of his apostleship, he says in verse 5, basically, okay, now it's your turn to produce proof. You prove the authenticity of your faith. Here I've produced evidence galore that I really am an apostle of Jesus. Now I want you to produce proof, Corinthians, that you're a true believer. And so he poses this question to him, or this statement in verse 5. If you'll notice it with me, he says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Now, again, as we said this morning, every single word in Scripture means something. And I want you to leave your Bible open. We're going to talk about what these words mean in just a second so we can understand more clearly what he is saying. The Apostle Paul says, hey, believers, hey, Corinthian Christians, hey, Christian Powell, hey, Hamilton Church, hey, everyone who's listening to this verse tonight, examine yourself. So let's look at what I call the admonition of the verse. The admonition. He says, I want you to examine yourself. That's an interesting word. It doesn't just mean to look at. It doesn't just mean to be tested in that sense, but it, it's a legal term. And it has the idea, carries the idea of a courtroom setting. It's, 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 it's the Lord saying to these people, it's the Lord saying, hey, I, I, want you to, I want you to put yourself on trial. Imagine, imagine tonight, if in America, if it were illegal to be a Christian, if, God forbid, if it were a crime to be a Jesus follower, I mean a real legit, true blue Jesus follower, let's say that it was a crime for that to exist or, or for us to be followers of Jesus, Christians. By the way, in other countries and other cultures, you realize it is illegal to profess faith in Jesus Christ and to be a vocal Jesus follower. My, my dear predecessor, my, my, my pastor has been able to go and teach Chinese pastors who will come from China and go study in Guam. And there in Guam, he teaches these pastors. They have to pastor in secret. They have to go into hiding. Let's say tonight that that was the case in America. And it was illegal for you to be a Christian. I want to ask you something. What if, what if, what if you were charged with the crime of being a Christian? What if you were brought in a courtroom setting and there was a jury, there was a prosecuting attorney and a defense attorney, 
and one by one, they begin to call witnesses for the prosecution. They're going to convince the jury that you are a Christian. They're going to lay out evidence that you're saved, that you are what you claim to be. Question for us. And what this word indicates is this. Would there actually be enough evidence against you to convict you of being a true Jesus follower? What's the evidence in your life that you're a Christian? Do you have any? Or is it just something that you say? Is it just something you profess? What the Apostle Paul is saying under the influence of the the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is don't just give me what you say. Don't just tell me about your talk. Tell me about your walk. Tell me not not just about your profession. Tell me about your life. What evidence is there in your life tonight that you really are a Christian? The question we ask is, if you were to die right now, like you are, like you sit in that chair, do you know 100% for sure that when you opened your eyes, would you open your eyes in heaven? Now, ladies and gentlemen, there might not be any more serious or sober question than that. Show me the evidence. Examine yourself. Bring the proof to the table and let's see it. So then he uses another word. He says, prove yourself. Now that word prove is an interesting word. It has an, this, this, this word picture back in the ancient times. The marketplace was a very strategic place in any city or town. That's where they would sell not just food and other wares, but they would sell goods. And one of the goods that they would sell in the ancient Near Eastern culture was pottery. They would have potters. Those that would create this pottery and they would sell them in the marketplace. Many times they would display the pottery out in the open and merchants would come by and they would pick up the pieces of pottery and sometimes what would happen is when the pottery was being fired, being heated, sometimes it would develop cracks in the porcelain. Of course, any crack in it would cheapen its value. And so what the porcelain dealers would do, what the potters would do, is they knew, especially the good ones, they knew how to take a wax. And they knew how to just, how to apply the wax, almost like a putty or a paint, and it would cover over the cracks in the pottery. And to the naked eye, there was no way to tell how authentic or not that piece of pottery was. They say the only way to tell was to hold that, that, that vessel, to hold that piece of pottery up to the noonday sun. And that God has so designed the sun, it is the most powerful light, you realize that, and that God has designed the sun in such a way to reveal the cracks and the blemishes in that pottery. And when a merchant, a shopper, would find one that didn't have, it didn't reveal any cracks. They would cry out and use a Latin term, and it was the term sincera. We get our word sincere from it, and it's a word that means without wax. And they would hold that, that piece up, and they would say, sincera, without wax. There's no cracks in this pottery. What Paul is saying is not only produce the evidence that you're a Christian, he's saying you hold your life and your spirit up, your soul, your profession, hold your profession up to the light of the S-O-N. You look at yourself through His holiness. 
and see if there's any cracks in your profession. That's the admonition. So let me give you the application. You still with me? Say amen. amen. Number one, it applies to people who make an insincere profession. Insincere. Now the Bible has a word for individuals with an insincere profession. It's not my word, it's a Bible word. It's the word hypocrite. It literally means in the Greek language a play actor. A stage player. Someone who's just acting. They're not real. They're not authentic. They're insincere. They're hypocrites. It's people who, who have a false profession. In Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, he gives us the account of Jesus when he was walking with his disciples down the road and he was hungry. The Bible says Jesus hungered and he noticed a tree, a fig tree on the side of the road and that fig tree in the time when of the, the figs were not ripe, they, this tree shouldn't have had figs, it shouldn't have even had any leaves, but this one particular fig tree had leaves. By it having leaves, it was in essence saying, I have figs, I have fruit. So Jesus approaches the fig tree with leaves, and the Bible is clear to say that Jesus examined it, and he saw nothing but leaves. All it had was leaves, it didn't have any fruit at all. Someone with an insincere profession is, a, is someone, someone who professes to be a believer. And man, you got all the leaves in the world. You got the church leaves. You got the tithing leaves. You might even have the baptism leaves. But you don't have any real fruit. You don't have any real proof. There's never been a 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, verse 17. All things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. You've never had that kind of transformation. You might have had a profession. You might have come forward in a church service. You might have had, had somebody write your name down on a card. You might have even prayed a prayer, but you have never been transformed from the inside out. You've never, as Jesus said and commanded in John chapter 3, two times he said, you must be born again, born again. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you have just one birth, you will have two deaths. You'll die physically and then for all eternity, unfortunately, you will die spiritually. But if you have two births, a physical birth and a spiritual birth, then you will only have one death. You may die physically, but you will live forever spiritually and eternally. You must be born again. But someone with an insincere profession has never been truly born again. But it also applies not just to an insincere profession. It applies to someone with, listen, an inconsistent profession. That's someone who talks a big game. And they may legitimately be saved. But they are not living like a Christian. The Bible calls that person backslidden. They're not living close to Jesus. They're not walking close to Jesus. They've literally turned their back on Jesus and they're sliding away from Jesus. We would call that person a carnal Christian. In fact, Paul identifies some of these Corinthians like this in the first letter. We call them a worldly-minded Christian. We might even call them a weak Christian, someone who is spiritually immature, and I've known people that have been saved for 60 years, but they're just as spiritually immature now as the day they got saved. That's an inconsistent profession. You may legitimately be saved, but you're living a life that is not consistent with what you claim to be. 
And then it applies to someone who has what I call an inaccurate profession. That's someone, ladies and gentlemen, who really legitimately believes that they are saved, but they're really not. I know someone like that. You're looking at him. When I was in the fourth grade, I, we started going to a Baptist church in Raleigh. It was a fairly new church. They were meeting in a school building. And one Sunday morning, I felt what I believed to be in my spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The pastor of that church plant preached. He preached the gospel. And I responded. I was sitting somewhere in this center section and I stepped out, came down the center aisle and I'll never forget, the pastor met me down here at the front and he called for a prayer, for, for an altar worker, a counselor to come and take me to a side prayer room. And I'll never forget, Brother Tommy, I came this way and went to that room right over there. Not that one, but one like it. And there were other people in the room. The counselor said, okay, son, what's your name? I told him what my name was. How old are you? What's your address? All right, let me pray with you. I don't know what he prayed. I don't ever remember praying myself. They walked me back out here, and I stood right here on the front row. He handed that card to the pastor, and the pastor read my name and said, Well, praise the Lord. We're glad that nine-year-old Christian came forward today to be saved. Amen. Except there was one big problem. Christian wasn't saved. I want any more saved than the man on the moon. I was just as lost when I stood there on the front row as I was when I was sitting in the chair. I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand salvation anymore. I didn't pray a prayer. I didn't, I, I didn't call on Christ. I didn't place my faith in Jesus alone. I wanted to be saved, but I didn't understand. I was co as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. I didn't know how to get to heaven. And for two years, two, listen to me, two years of my life, I remember waking up. I was a kid. You're like, you were a kid. You don't remember that. I remember every bit of it. I remember waking up and look, staring out the wind at night. And I remember thinking, Lord, if I were to die, where would I go? I didn't know. I didn't know that you could know. But I wanted to know. And thank God through His sovereign plan and providence, God led us to another church. God led us to a thoroughly gospel preaching church in one Sunday night in February of 1983. So it's coming up next week, next Sunday, a week from today. It'll be 37 years ago that night that I did step out and I did come forward and they took me to a prayer room. But this time it was altogether different because somebody got out their Bible and they explained the gospel to me and I called on Jesus and I didn't just say a prayer. I called on Jesus to save me and Jesus saved me that night. I have no doubt about it and I've never doubted it since then. Glory to the Lamb of God. And I got it settled that night. And I want you to know, dear friend, I don't know who's here, and I don't know who needs to be here in this, but you don't have to leave this room tonight doubting where you would go if you were to die. You can know like you know what your name is. You can know that you're saved by Jesus Christ alone. Then God gives us the alarm in the last phrase of the verse. He uses the word reprobates, and it's a very interesting word. It literally means rejected or cast away. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's coming a time when all of us are going to stand before God in judgment. And we're either going to be accepted in the Beloved through Christ 
and through what Jesus did for us. And our trust and faith in that, His finished work. Hear me now. Or we're going to be rejected. Reprobate. That means cast aside and cast into hell. Jesus talks in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 about a group of people who had the right words. They said, Lord, Lord, they even had the right works. Lord, Lord, didn't we preach the gospel in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't, didn't you use us to see people healed from diseases in your name? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, hear me, the saddest words I know anywhere in the Bible, depart from me. I never, that means I never, ever knew Depart from me. Because ladies and gentlemen, someone, listen carefully, someone gets to heaven not because of what they do. Hear me. Someone gets to heaven because of what they do with Jesus Christ. And you either receive him as Lord or you reject him. Mark 1.15 says to repent, that means to change your mind. You change your mind about your sin. You change your mind about your unbelief. And you change your mind about Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. Here's the gospel. That Jesus Christ as the Son of God left heaven, came to this earth, lived 33 years sinless years as the perfect sacrifice and took your place and mine on Calvary's cross. And when he was hanging there those six hours on that Friday, he was suffering my hell and your hell and the hell of everyone else for all eternity. And I either accept that free gift by faith alone or I reject him. It's not through baptism. It's not through good works. It's not through who your grandparents or your parents are. Remember, gang, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. Do you know that you know that you're saved? Do you know that you're trusting in Christ alone? For your eternal salvation. His name was Ivan McGuire. He was 35 years old. And he had made previously 800 jumps. He was an instructor in Franklin County, North Carolina. And in April of 1988, on a Saturday afternoon, he did what he had done 800 times he loaded up in a little airplane with a client, a customer, that he had trained how to jump out of an airplane. And he donned his video camera. And when it came time, when it came time, and they had hit the altitude of 10,500 feet, Ivan McGuire, for one last time, jumped out of an airplane to video his customer. And he jumped. And he counted down just like he had always counted down to get to the right altitude after videoing. And he made sure that he got it on camera that his customer had pulled their chute and their chute deployed. And they were gently floating safely down to the landing zone. Ivan, you could see on the video camera, he reached over to where his cord was supposed to be. You can see him turn his head and look. 
there was no cord. And instinctively, he reached down to his right thigh where there was supposed to be a reserve cord. And he looked down, and there was no reserve cord. And what they believe is in the rush of getting on the plane that he had mistaken his camera equipment for the chute. And he never put it on. And falling at 150 miles an hour, the last recorded words he said on the camera was, Oh no. And then the camera went blurry. And Ivan McGuire, an expert, jumped to his death. You say, Christian, my word. That is terrible. Yes, it really is. I can't even imagine. But let me tell you something even more infinitely terrible than that. Is sitting here in this church tonight and hearing the clear gospel of Jesus Christ on how to know that you are saved. And yet one day to leave this world. You've never made full preparation to meet God. I want to ask you to bow your head all over this room, please, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask you if you are a believer and you know how to pray, to please pray for someone around you. We're quiet. You say, preacher, I'm in one of those three categories. And God has spoken to me. I want to make sure that I am a legit believer in Jesus. I understand now what the gospel is. I understand that only Jesus can save. I want him to save me. I want to nail it down and nail it down tight that I am a Christian. I want to call on Jesus right now to save me. I'm going to ask you, friend, to do just that. Right where you sit, would you call on the Lord? He says in Romans chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Verse 13, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are promises from a perfect gentleman, the Lord Jesus. And tonight where you are, would you say to him something like this? You call out to him. You pray to him from your heart, from your lips. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. There is nothing I can do to get myself to heaven. You died for me in my place on the cross. You suffered my hell. I believe that. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. I receive you. I embrace you as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm trusting completely in what you did for me on the cross. You shed your blood to take away my sins. You died in my place. I receive that, Jesus. And I take your free gift of eternal life tonight. Help me to live for you. Thank you, Jesus. Our heads are bowed, our eyes closed.
I want you to know what Jesus said, that whosoever believes in him is not ashamed. You say, preacher, tonight, tonight, I just called on Jesus and I nailed it down that I am a child of God. I nailed it down that my name is written in heaven and I am not ashamed. Preacher, that was me. I just called on Jesus to save me from my sins and I am not ashamed. I ask you, friend, if that's you, would you hold your hand up just long enough for me to see it? God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. Preacher, that was me. I called on Jesus tonight to save me. I am not ashamed. God bless you, young man. Yes, you can put your hand down. Preacher, don't leave me out. I trusted Jesus Christ tonight, and I am not ashamed. I want to say this to you, dear friends, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. There were at least six or seven that raised their hand. And I want you to know I praise Jesus for everyone who made a sincere profession. And can we thank God for that right now and give these folks a dear hand. Would you do that with me, church? Our heads are bowed. I'm going to ask you something. Those of you that raised your hand that are not ashamed, that called on Christ tonight for salvation, would you do something? I want you, only you, only you who raised your hand, I want you to lift your head and lift your eyes and look right at me, please. I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. Brother Tommy and Brother Cam both are going to be standing here, one on either side. I'm going to ask you to do this because we would love to put some material in your hand and have a word of prayer with you privately. You're not going to miss any activity. You're not going to miss anything that's going to go on after this. This is important. This is letting us connect with you about the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. Would you do it? You can come take me by the hand. I'm going to ask all of us to stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.